Awesome to welcome Richard Patino to the podcast to share the game with us. Coach Patino is head coach of the University of New Mexico. He has previously been head coach at Minnesota and at Florida International University. Before that, he was an assistant under his father, Rick Patino, for two seasons at Louisville. He also worked as an assistant coach for Billy Donovan at Florida for two seasons. He has been a part of seven NCAA tournaments, including two as a head coach. He has also been a part of three Elite Eight runs and one Final Four berth as an assistant. Coach Patino, welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much for having me. I, I tell you what, I'm I'm honored. I listen to it all the time. It's uh, it's cool to be picked by you to do it uh, because I do listen a bunch, and it's uh, I take a lot of nuggets from it. Following you on Twitter, listening to the podcast, so it's great. I appreciate it. Well, it's it's a lot of fun. It's been a lot of fun to connect with you a little bit here too, and. Uh, Back in 2015, when I traveled the world with my family, I visited practice at Minnesota. I'm not sure if you remember that. I do. I remember it. I remember <laughs> that was when we were all allowed to travel, and uh, but I do remember it, which is great. So I, it was. Uh, I know you're a basketball junkie. I'm a basketball junkie, and sometimes we forget a little bit about what it is that we get to do, and uh, that we should be grateful for it. So it's cool to see people like you who love the game. Well, thank you. And I agree. Like, and one of the takeaways from that, and really two of the takeaways that I want to share with people, one was how personable you were. Cause I've told I've attended a lot of practices like you have. And uh, you know, I mean, it's, it's just at that time, it wasn't the basketball pad, podcast, basketball immersion just started. I was just some dude that wanted to come learn and watch basketball. And, and you were so personable and it was very impressive, not just you, but your staff and your players and the way that they embraced having someone there. And I assume that's part of your philosophy within the program. Yeah, I mean, it's. It, I talk to them all the time about, um, guys, be a good person. Like, let's not complicate this thing. When, when, when you meet somebody, hey, look them in the eye, introduce yourself. You used to be able to shake hands. You're not going to do that anymore. Um, but like all these things that we're trying to teach you in life, like are very, very simple. It's how do you deal with people? How do you treat people? Um, and that can translate uh, on the court as well. So uh, that's kind of number one rule for me when running a program is be a good person. And we all know what being a good person is all about. It's whether or not we're going to decide to do that. So um, very, very important um, that we do that. Well, it was impressive that. And I'll get, tell you the other thing, which I value tremendously, is that your kids were at practice. And I think at the time it was only two kids or maybe you just had your other one. But um, th that I hadn't seen a lot. And I always made a point of doing that, that I always embraced my kids being at practice so they got a deeper understanding of where daddy was and what he was doing. Yeah, I mean, it's um, growing up a coach's son. Um, my dad, and it's a little bit different. Like when my dad grew up coaching, the older generation, I don't want to sound like I'm criticizing my dad, but the older generation was not as present at being parents. Um, like the amount of things that I do, I just laugh at. I'm like, there is no way my dad would be driving me to a soccer practice, sitting there, getting to know the other parents. Uh, but the one thing I always did was, man, after, after school, I would walk to Memorial Coliseum where Kentucky was practicing. I would do my homework at the scorer's table. I was a part of it. And uh, I truly believe that that's the key to this thing, because I do think the new age in coaching is somewhat separating it, like disconnecting from it, if you possibly can, um, which I try very hard to do, uh, but also getting them around and getting my players to see me as a father, uh, getting my kids to love being a part of the team. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, that's the way I grew up and that's the way that, that my kids are certainly uh, going to be raised as well. Well, I love that. And that, what you just said there about demonstrating what it means to be a parent. And we think about that is probably one of the most important things that we can we can mentor in our players. Right. Yeah, it's again, it's it's like what we talk about. It's it's, it's good. Be a good person. Um, you know, I, I'm truly convinced that I got and I know we'll certainly talk about it, but. There's not too many people and with all humility that could lose a job and get another really good basketball job in less than 24 hours, unless they handled themselves the right way over a nine year span of being a head coach and eight in the big 10. I mean, the thing about when you're in the big 10 for eight years, you you're on display 24 seven and the way that you treat people 
is very, very important. Um, and being a good father, I, I, I say to my wife all the time, you know, I'm going to lose in basketball, hopefully not too much, but I'm never going to lose being a father. Uh, I just won't do it. That's just, it's too important to me to be a great father, be a great husband, be a great, you know, person. And I think, um, I learned a lot of that from Billy Donovan, um, who I know, you know, from going to his clinics and stuff, I was blown away by Billy. Um, when I took that job, I was an assistant coach for my father for two years and I got out of my comfort zone and decided to go to Florida and it was the greatest decision I ever made, but you could tell with Billy Donovan, there was a conscious effort every single day to be a great person. And maybe that's spiritually and, and, you know, but he, he would, that was at the forefront of, he thought he would be a better coach and a better father and a better husband if he worked on himself first. And so certainly I try to do that uh, as much as I possibly can. Well, so many great lessons already in there. And uh, we're going to do a little self-reflection. And, uh, you know, I think that's something that's often lost in this process. And, uh, you know, to qualify that again, like you've had tremendous success as an assistant and as, as a head coach. And I, as you mentioned, moving on to another job, there's no doubt you haven't had time probably to self-reflect much, but you still go through that process. So maybe let's start with this. Just give us an idea. What does success look like for you and your program? So we have a baseline to be able to kind of discuss this. Yeah, I've had I've had a weird career um, and I'm not even 40 years old. And I, I think I'm going on because I've been doing these Zooms and I don't really think about it much, but I'm going on year 17 in the profession. Amazing. Um, and, and I'm going on year 10 of being a head coach. And I, I probably need to talk about myself more because that's what recruiting is. But I mean, I've been a high school coach. I've been a college video coordinator. Um, and then obviously on the D1. Uh, but, you know, it's it's I am not one like to say that we, we got hit with injuries. It was the injuries fault or, you know, I'm not a bitter like when I was fired at Minnesota, like you know, I think my AD, Mark Coyle, was more broken up about it than I was, to be honest with you. Um, but there are certainly things I know I could have done better. And I'm grateful for this opportunity to start fresh. Um, I didn't have enough depth at Minnesota. Uh, and, you know, I think looking back, I would I would draw in that starting lineup of where I envisioned it. And I said, OK, like we're good there and we're good there. We don't need that. Um, I needed to do a better job of of just building a stronger program. Cause I had two teams that I thought were really, really good, good. That got wrecked by injuries. Um, and so, you know, there, there's things looking back, I could have done better. I, I think where I'm really, really excited about is just having clarity of what the mission is. I think I got a little bit tired um, in the la in the later years of, getting together with the staff every single day and being clear, this is what I want. Uh, because I think I am one of the most humble, I, you know, that sounds arrogant saying that, but I feel like I'm very, very humble, but we need to, I, I need to make sure that every single assistant coach and every single player and the train, they understand that we're going to do things my way and um, figuring out what that way is, what's best for your program, right? I mean, not my way because I have this ego. So I needed to do a better job there, I think, um, to where everybody you know, I probably took that for granted. My father was terrific at that. He had a belief in what he was going to do. And it doesn't matter what you do. It could be you want to play zone. You can play man. You want to pressure. He was so fully bought into his belief of what it is that, he did, that everybody understood what that was. Uh, so reflecting back, I think I needed to do a better job there um, of just taking control of every little aspect of it. You know, I think you get to the highest level and you're paying your guys so much money. You want to give them freedom. Uh, and you still want to give them freedom, but you got to be crystal clear as to what it is that the standard is in the program. So there is no gray area. And um, I'm really going to reflect on that over the spring and summer and fall to kind of get this, you know, everybody in alignment. Um, I, PJ Fleck was phenomenal. Hell, I don't even know if he's a good football coach tonight. He's a good friend of mine. But what I do know is he obviously is a great football coach, but he has a plan. It's crystal clear. And he has a great way of communicating that plan. So there, there's definitely um, a desire for me to get better at that uh, with everybody that I hire and bring on board. 
Well, and everything you're saying makes sense in terms of that process and uh, trying to reach clarity and do those different things. So I'm curious then with that, you mentioned communicating it. What are some best ways to communicate it then um, and, and to meet that balance of obviously freedom, but making sure that they're meeting the accountability that you set forward? You know, I, I got to a point, I, I get, I probably get way too, when the season starts, I get consumed with the next opponent and certainly my players. Uh, I probably watch too much film, you know, for playing Michigan State. Like, why do I need to watch their last six games? I know exactly what Michigan State's going to do or Purdue or, you know, Wisconsin or so on. Um, meet with your staff probably a little bit more. I, I got a little – I didn't love doing that as much. And, um, you know, I think that, again, it's, it's getting together with them, being, you know, everybody on the same page when we leave – uh, so that it's not, hey, that's assistant coach's scout, and and it's just me and him working together. Like, let's get all on the same page. Let's get, be a little bit more collaborative on what it is that we're doing. Um, you know, and we, and we did a lot of that, but I still look back and say, okay, like, we we needed to establish more of an identity of this is what we're going to do. And I think it all comes down to communication. Um, I tell my staff all the time, Everything that we are asking you to do, just remember, we criticize our players when they don't communicate with each other or they're not extremely unselfish or they, they pout when coach gets on them. Well, you guys have got to be the same. We got to be the same. So everything that we're pushing on a team, I always laugh and say the adults are worse than the kids. And a lot of the time it is that. Uh, so again, it, it's just being crystal clear on what it is that we're trying to do on a daily basis, um, making sure that everybody knows, like, hey, if I don't like a recruiting vi you know, video, like telling them, let's get this thing fixed uh, and just being very, very transparent on that. So I can tell you after nine years of being a head coach, it's so much less about the out of bounds plays and the pick and roll defense and so much more about that culture building and things like that. Uh, you know, just being dialed into that every single day is, is very, very important. Well, and you mentioned a whole bunch of things there. And one that uh, makes me self-reflect is on that piece that especially what I, what I phrase is aftercare, which is the ability to communicate with your players after practices, after games or after tests or after moments. And what people sometimes don't understand is the energy it requires to balance all that, because that is the part where I could not agree with you more meetings to me, became this really tricky thing, which was a balance between being purposeful and a waste of time that was taking energy away from other things that may lead towards player development and team success more. Can you talk a little bit about these different areas in terms of meetings and then obviously those conversations with players? Yeah, I, I would say it's such a good point. I was getting drained by them. Um, I was getting and I probably needed to do a better job of just running the meetings, you know, because you're around each other so much. And then all of a sudden you got one assistant coaches on the phone texting and you got, you know, ones on his iPad. Hey, what are you looking at? What do we, you know, um, I probably needed to do a better job there um, to where it doesn't drain us too much, but don't over meet. I think you can over meet. Um, but the most important assets and you can't forget about it are your current players because we get consumed with recruiting and we get consumed with this. You pour your heart and soul into the players uh, to make sure that they're in alignment with what it is that you're trying to do. So, um, and I thought I've always had pretty good relationships with our guys. I mean, I, I, I communicate well with them. Uh, I'm younger, but I'm experienced. So I certainly, you know, they, they, they understand that I connect with them. But again, it comes down to, Yes, you do need to connect with them. And it is very, very important to have team building stuff. It is. And it's important to have individual meetings for sure. The most important thing is those two hours a day when you're on the practice court, you get that right. And when you're in the film room, you get that right. Because I've seen a lot of people get the team building stuff right and get the on the court stuff wrong. And you got no chance. Um, so it, it's making sure that your guys have, you know, understand you do want what's best for them, but making sure that the team winning is what's, what's best for them. 
that's what's best for everybody. So you can't deviate from what it is that you're doing there. So um, hold them to a high standard, hold them accountable. They want you to treat them all somewhat the same or to the same rules. Uh, you're going to treat them differently because they're all differently and kind of go from there. It is amazing how winning makes everyone happier, isn't it? <laughs> it's well, sometimes I, I that laugh simple. at this. <laughs> yeah, like Mark Few is a good friend of mine. And, you know, Mark Few is always the poster child for you got all these coaches who are they're, they're 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 frustrated, they're angry, they're in the office early, they're staying late, they're they're you know, and Mark Few is out like fly fishing, and and I'm like, well, that's all well and good, but you've won like 39 games, <laughs> or like my dad growing up, where you know when he was at Kentucky, I mean, he's having historic runs, and everything is good, um, and that's been the beauty of me is, I mean, I've I've been at the top, I've been at the bottom, I've been in the middle. I've kind of seen it all at a young age. Um, and I think I'm pretty even keel with that because of the volatility of our profession. Um, but yes, um, to say, and, and we're all process driven and so on, but to say that winning and losing doesn't matter, we're, we're all lying. It does matter. Um, and it, what the key is, is getting everybody bought in to seeing that winning will affect your life because there's becoming too many examples of why you don't need to win anymore to, to make money. Um, there's kids that are leaving basketball programs that they don't win and they're still getting drafted. There's assistant coaches who are not winning and they're getting head jobs. And so it used to be when I was working at Louisville in Florida, it was like, God, if we can get to a final four, well then like when I got to a final four, I got my chance at FIU. It's changed a little bit, but there's exceptions to every rule. And I think at the end, it flushes out to where the winners are going to get more opportunities than the teams that don't. Um, so everything is better in this profession when you win, uh, but certainly doing it the right way is very, very important as well. well. I'm glad you brought up that mental health piece. Would you talk about, cause we talk about that a lot with players, but we probably don't talk about it enough with coaches. And that Mark few example is a great one. And I found later in my coaching career, I was a much better coach. The less I worked. So I'm curious, are we putting unfair expectations, which are really media driven and fan expectations on what a coach should be? I have to be grinding every minute of the day, like the, that type of word where I'm probably more effective if I'm not grinding. For sure. And, and, and I think, um, I think the we're getting better at it. I remember I met my early years at Minnesota with a sports psychologist about one of my players. And I said to him, I said, you know, I, Doc, so and so is just he's just weird and he's aloof and I just can't connect with him. And, uh, you know, how do you fix him? And he made a great point to me. He's like, well, I can fix you so that you can fix him. I can't fix him, but I can fix the way that you deal with him. I try very, very hard um, to, you know, be right. You know what I mean? Mentally, because. You, we are so, and it's no fault of anybody's through marketing departments or media members. They want access and marketing wants you to tweet out that you're in the gym or you're on the road and everybody wants to know where everybody is at all times. There is a time and place for that for sure, but you've got to shut it down. Um, and the bottom line is if you're worn down as a coach and you're burnt out, your staff's going to be burnt out. Your players are going to see it. So whatever it is that you can do when you have practice at three o'clock to be the right you, you need to do that. And there's a million different ways to do it. When I was at Louisville, we would get in every single day at 6 a.m. And it's just it was my dad's way. Um, and because we'd have a 630 meeting and, you know, it's just it was his way. It's not my way. Uh, I want to drive. And again, it's not criticizing, it's criticizing. If you want to do that, maybe you're an early morning person. You like getting a workout in or whatever, but I don't like that. I like to have my cup of coffee. I like to unplug a little bit, you know, maybe take my kids to school um, so that I'm right for the time when I do get in um, because it has become more and more about working smart, I think, than working hard. And I think I work very, very hard, but you could waste a lot of time trying to show you're working hard versus actually doing it. So it's too important because we're so consumed with social media um, 
we're on it 24 seven. The people that claim they're not on it are normally lying about not being on it. Um, and the, the problem is with this, with the social media piece is we've created these groups of people. And the problem is everybody in your group is reading it. And until you can create a group where nobody's reading it, 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 do, it does matter and it does affect your job. Um, so having a confidence level that, yeah, I hear that noise. And I see what other people, may, but I'm still good. And being self-assured about that is very, very important for coaches to understand. Well, that's a great segue because I was going to ask you about confidence and some different things like that during a transition. But I also want to say that I was always impressed with how you showed up on social media. Like, I do think, again, like you can avoid it or you can kind of engage it in the right ways. And I thought some of your, for lack of, I guess, humor might be the way that you kind of approached it was, was really cool and disarming to people, I'm sure. Yeah, I mean, I think, um, and I'm not even a huge social media guy, but I think it helped me um, a little bit, especially in the Twin Cities, because I'm just not a self promoter. And um, I think that my social media showed the type of person I was or am, and they show that that's important to me. Because what is important to me is I love coaching basketball. I love to laugh, you know, uh, I love being a father and a husband. And I think if you, if you see that it's not orchestrated, you know what I mean? Not, somebody's not doing it for me. Um, I don't take myself too seriously. So I think there's, there is value in utilizing it a certain way. Just don't be fake. I think everybody can see that. Um, you know, if you're going to go, you know, do community service, just go do it. Like, you know, things like that. And um, there is a time for place in place for promoting your program, which we all got to do. Uh, but there's so much insincerity on social media. It, it's, it's honestly embarrassing in a lot of ways. So I've tried very, very hard to not do that, but also tried very, very hard to stay off it and not take it as seriously uh, as some people do, because there's small little victories and in the end, they don't really going to get you anywhere. Um, you know, so understanding that's important. Yeah. And I'm curious then, like with the transition from Minnesota to New Mexico, is there, is, there any, is there any impact on your confidence? Because I know as coaches, like people don't understand, like sometimes from game to game as coaches, we have these moments of, you know, sometimes our confidence isn't as high as we would think it would be. And it's this constant reminder to come back to our base and say, listen, no, no. I'm, I'm good enough and I can get this done. Can you talk a little bit about that piece? Yeah, uh, for sure. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm a fired head coach at 38 years old, uh, but it's like anything else. You got to get back to your base. And for every time I see that, I'm looking at a big 10 coach of the year trophy that's sitting right there or a final four where I was associate head coach trophy um, right there. And, you know, with all humility, just realizing that, I have accomplished a lot at a very, very young age um, and not taking it personal. Um, Bill Belichick was fired. <laughs> you know, I mean, it, it, it's, it's, there's, it's just a constant obsession with getting better every single day, being self-aware and saying, okay, like last year's team at Minnesota was top 15 in the country. We had injuries and all of a sudden we couldn't win. Well, injuries weren't the total problem. Look yourself in the mirror and say, where could I have done better? Um, but don't be bitter. There's too many coaches in this profession. We don't care that you were fired 15 years ago. Um, I moved on quicker than probably anybody. In the, and now I was lucky because I got a really cool opportunity in Mexico, but nobody cares. Um, there's a great expression that I think my dad told me about, um, you know, like Tommy Lasorda, I think, said about, you know, 80 percent of the world. Uh, are, you know, don't care about your problems. I think the other 20% are happy you have them. Um, and, and it's, it's, I'm probably butchering that a little bit, but I do believe that I, there is a small collection of people, your family, some of your close, close, close friends. And that's about it that really, really want to hear about your plight in this world. So I always took pride in never, ever complaining, uh, ever, you know, about whatever the circumstances may be, uh, may be. Uh, but you know, as for the, the confident part of it, like I'm very, very confident, um, 
in what I'm doing. But a lot of that has to do with just being prepared on a daily basis and understanding that there's always going to be elements that are out of your control in this profession. And you know what? If you made a mistake, own it, move on. Don't beat yourself up about it. Um, all the things that we harp to our players about pumping them up and having their self-esteem and feeling great about themselves. There's a lot of coaches that don't do that on their end. Uh, they don't. And um, so I work very, very hard at it. Uh, I'm not bitter. I'm not, I mean, I got to coach in one of the best basketball conferences in all of college basketball against some of the great coaches and went toe to toe with, with a lot of them. Um, things happen in this profession. I had eight great years at Minnesota. I hope to get another great opportunity here to build it. Um, but I'm, I'm, I'm grateful for taking, for getting this opportunity. I did worry about maybe if I sat out, would I be beating myself up a little bit? Um, I wanted to keep coaching. I'm too young to sit out. Uh, so, you know, I always look at if you can get a job where you're top four in your league and you're at one of those jobs, you take it. And New Mexico is that. Uh, so, no, I'm, I'm – uh, but it's like anything else. I'm not superhuman. There are days where I'm like, man, you know, because my family loved Minnesota. Like, I've never lived in a place longer than eight years of my life. I just met a guy in the hallway, and he said, Coach, where are you from? And I kind of looked at him like, I don't know. I'm kind of from all over. Um, eight years was the most I'd ever lived in a place in Minnesota. And, and so, you know, that's a great journey. And I'm excited to get better at whatever it is that we're doing here in New Mexico. And, uh, but yes, reminding yourself every single day and whatever it is that you're doing, make sure that you're putting yourself in the best possible position to succeed, whether it's being in great health, you know, getting great sleep, working out, exercising. Uh, meditating, you know, growing as a coach, you got to do all those things to get better, just like you'd ask your players to do. I'm curious, then you mentioned family, how did you prepare your family? How did you and your wife prepare your kids for the transition? Well, you know, we only had one kid. So my wife moved a lot with me before we had Ava, who is now 10 years old. And we thought, hey, this is hard. Like that was easy. When you don't have kids, it is easy. Um, we became ingrained in the Minnesota community. Um, we had two children born there. Um, we have met some really, really good friends who we're really close with, who are kids. It's one of those, hey, let's get together, have a bottle of wine. We unload the kids and we all play and the doors are open in Minnesota and everybody's coming. I mean, it was great. And I got to a point at Minnesota where I, I just wanted to win so I could keep that. Um, and you know what? It's a great lesson. Uh, for us. I mean, there've been a lot of tears, you know, my wife is still in Minnesota and I keep telling her, Hey, you are going to have to move at some point. Kids are finishing up school, obviously, uh, but there's been a lot of tears because um, she's loved it there. My kids love it there. I'm probably more accustomed to it just because I bounced around a lot as a kid. And um, you know, it's uh, more than anything. I think the stronger your relationship with your wife and your kids are that, that, that core group, you can go anywhere as long as you love each other and you love being around each other. And, and, you know, that's right. Um, so we're, we're being tested right now. Luckily we've got a great family um, and we've got a, I have a great marriage with my wife, so um, we can go wherever, but you know what basketball, this is why basketball is great. I look at it the other way. The fact that I went from Miami to Minnesota, I'm now living in New Mexico it just shows you the cool places that you can go in this profession um, and embrace it, you know, enjoy going on this ride and this journey together um, because that's what basketball is. It's going to open up a million different doors. You get the opportunity to coach, you get the opportunity to compete and impact guys lives. So it's all the way you look at it. Uh, it's easier for the coach because the coach is in the fight every day, right? Uh, they're going to the office early. You know, we're making recruiting calls. We're on the Zooms. Your wife isn't as much. Um, so, you know, it's a little bit more challenging, this move. But I know once they get here and they see the support in the community here, uh, there's great people everywhere. Absolutely. Absolutely. And uh, w with that, maybe what are some of the biggest misconceptions people might have about the hiring and firing process in college basketball? Well, I, I, I would say that... Um, probably some of the best feedback that I got was the way that I handled 
the last couple of the weeks of the season um, because we had had injuries. We, we knew we weren't going to win. I mean, you know, I was down two starters. It just that my first team was good. The second team just was not as good. And when you're in a league like the Big Ten, it was you were dying a bit of a slow death. Um, and I knew the writing was on the wall. I didn't take it personal. I still talk to Mark Coyle, my AD at Minnesota, like twice a week. Like, I'm like, hey, leave me alone, man. Stop, you know, like you can still be friends with somebody who wants to make a decision to go somewhere else. And I think the biggest thing that anybody has to understand is just because Mark fired me doesn't mean they don't love me as a person. And that's a good lesson for coaches. Like, hey, just because I'm bringing you off the bench, it's not personal. I'm doing what I think is best for the team. Mark Coyle is doing what he thinks is best for the athletic department at the University of Minnesota. Don't take it personal. Um, so that process of, you know, bringing me in and firing me wasn't cursing and screaming and yelling and throwing things. It was, I understand, um, you know, when we both care about each other, I want what's best for you. Uh, he hired my assistant who was there for five years in a weird little way. I mean, I, I, I take pride in that. Um, I want Minnesota to do well. I'm not bitter. That's not what we're doing. Um, that's not the way I'm going to live my life. As for the hiring, pro the hiring process is unique. Um, you know, I, I, I found out I was getting fired on like a, a Friday and I was never like officially fired. I think Minnesota wanted me to get to Mexico because of some financial deals or they could get out of this. Um, but all of a sudden I was told hop on a plane on Friday and, and, and go meet with uh, the AD at New Mexico. Um, I didn't, I wasn't, uh, and it was because I had so many emotions. We played on a Thursday. I met with Mark on a Friday and then I was on a plane Friday night. I didn't have this big presentation. Um, I was just myself, you know, and I'm not saying a presentation is bad, but I think when you've been a head coach now for nine years, like your body of work is going to speak for yourself. I think that what people have to understand is every AD does the same thing. They have their people that they call. And if your resume and your character checks out, you've got a chance. If it doesn't, you've got no chance because, you know, like your reputation is very, very important. Well, there's no, there's no, and, and that's why it's so important to go work for good people. Um, it's no, it's no coincidence that I got hired at the University of Minnesota because Norwood Teague was the AD. Norwood had hired Anthony Grant, Shaka Smart, both Billy Donovan assistant coaches, both well respected, right? Well, there's no coincidence that Eddie Nunez, and it wasn't that he hired me. Like Billy told him, you have to hire Richard Patino. Like that wasn't it. But Eddie knows what he's getting with somebody who's part of Billy Donovan's family. ADs knew what they were getting when they hired somebody part of Rick Patino's family. Um, Matt Painter is a one I think now where people are getting so much respect. And, you know, Matt and I are friends. And like he, you hire Micah Shrewsbury at a Purdue, you know what you're getting. Um, so that process, I still think. Because of social media, there, there's these assistants and there's these coaches that work the media, but don't actually live by it. And they're getting these small victories instead of the big victories um, in the end. So be a great person. Work your butt off. If you have an opportunity to cut a corner that's going to uh, come back to haunt you in the end, don't do it. Don't do it. Um, because that that process and, and people don't realize like the hiring process there's ad's i know that called me about other searches not about me and i told them hey this is what i know the reputation is i don't know that like so they're calling around and it's a small there's only 300 something to these jobs so you make sure you got to act with integrity when you're on the road recruiting like hey represent yourself the right way because somebody may call around yeah no he's a good guy he works hard he's organized um, you know, he, you got to tell that story the right way. And so the hiring process, um, happens probably a little quicker than you think it does. There's not as many people in the room. Um, you know, there may be one or two people in the room and then there, you may talk to the president. So, but it's a small circle. Um, I think people think agents get people jobs. They don't, I don't think they do. They may get your foot in the door. They don't do that. 
Um, but the bottom line is your body, of, your body of work and whatever it is that you do really matters. Winning matters. Um, you know, and, and in Minnesota, yes, I, I got fired, but I won. I mean, it, you know, th- there was a lot. I won and I won with integrity and I had players that went on to the NBA and did a lot of good things. So what you do certainly matters as well. And then when you do get into that job interview, be yourself. You know, be yourself. People know it's it's a lot more casual than people realize. Um, you know, don't 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 BS them because they'll sniff that out pretty good. Well, and you definitely won. I mean, two NCAA tournaments, an IT championship, and you, even at FIU, your first winning season in 12, 12 years. So the body of work is really good. So it's no surprise you got another job and another opportunity. I'm curious then circling back a little bit. We talked about maybe some of the things that you would have done more of. So let's maybe go into technical tactical just a little bit and say, is there anything that you think you would have done more of or less of technically tactically that could have helped? Yeah, I would say um, if you look at in the big 10, right? I mean, obviously the, the, the Dean of the big 10 is Tom Izzo. Coach Izzo is a great person. Um, I absolutely have so much respect for him. I'm not going to take one play he runs and bring it to New Mexico and say, man, this one's unstoppable. We're going to run this one. Now, what I will say is it was really hard to screen his team. Every time you talked about screening, they fight over it. Uh, So that toughness piece of getting over screens, the rebounding piece, right? I mean, who would have thought that somebody could build a program solely on rebounding? You take that from it, right? And and you certainly um, can carry that over. I think I probably took for granted a little bit working for my father. Like, there's not one drill my dad did where I was like, this is a great drill. But every single day, man, you competed your butt off. Um, You know, and and I think that that's something where uh, working really, really hard to develop that culture of competitiveness um, is something that maybe regardless of how we're guarding things or what we're doing, because I won the NIT. We played a lot of zone, um, at FIU, we went from three wins to 18 wins. We did that 22 to two, 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 one press to a matchup zone. Um, that's all fine. Like uh, it's fine. You could, the bottom line is stick to what it is, uh, that you're doing. And, you know, I think if I take anything from it, you're not screening us. You're not blocking us out. We're out running you. Um, those are the big things, I think. Instead of the when the game is set and you're running a set, I think that's a little overrated. I think it's how do you how do you get a stop without fouling? You know, Bo Ryan's another one. I got a lot of respect for Bo Ryan built his program on two things. Not fouling, which if you've ever played against Bo Ryan, they never foul according to him, right? And then two, don't turn the ball over. So when I think about the tactical part of it, it's we're going to emphasize not turning it over. We're going to defend without fouling. And we're going to find a way to go against a unset defense. That's the biggest thing. How, how do we find a way to not go against your set defense? And maybe that's, you know, that's being fundamentally sound defensively so that your 20-something plus opportunities to get out on the break are terrific. Uh, you know, disrupt them. Take, take what take what really bothered you and do it. Like I hated going against teams that downed because it took us out of our flow. Well, why don't I down? Right. I mean, I, big guys hate getting trapped on the block. And Luca Garza this year, we did a great job on him. And he still scored like 25 points. He hated getting trapped, do all the things that you hate, right. And do it um, and disrupt them, you know, and from a defensive side of it, it's not about zone. It's not about man. What I can tell you when it comes to defense, do your job on the ball. On the ball is the most important thing. I don't care what you're doing. Um, You know, so I take all those, but I think an unrelenting just we're coming at you. We're going to punch you in the mouth. Um, It's like Purdue. Purdue runs 900 sets. I used to make fun of Painter all the time. I'm like, I know you don't know every play you run. And he probably doesn't. But what I did know is every time that shot went up and there was somebody crashing to the weak side, that guard was going right to the nail. Um, you know, so just build a core foundation of what it is that you're going to do. Do that. 
And then I tell you the other thing uh, from a tactical standpoint, get your players better, get them better. Don't complain about the deficiencies and say, well, so-and-so can't dribble, right? Like you'll be in a meeting with your staff and you'll say he can't do that. Well, I don't see you working on it before. Right. Or so-and-so is not a good free throw shooter. Well, are, are, what are we doing? My, my father was amazing at that. Just obsessing over getting better at the deficiencies every single day. I'm so glad you brought that up. You mentioned the down piece and ball screen defense and just thinking like so much of what I struggled with as a coach or what I didn't like preparing for or what I knew was going to be something we had to really get good at is are the things that gave me the most development as a coach, right? Because those are the things that you're like, Oh my gosh, like they do that so well, we have to figure out how to get better or how to counter it in some way. For sure. And I think, I think coaches should really reflect every single year and say to themselves, okay, what do I hate going against? What is a pain in the butt? And see if we can build that into what it is that we're doing into the fall. Um, you know, but get comfortable with it. You know, if you can't coach it, don't do it. Um, somebody called me today about the matchup zone and they said, well, you know, why don't, why don't you do it anymore? I said, I don't do it anymore because I didn't love coaching it. I just didn't love every time somebody scored. Oh, I thought I was supposed to bump. I thought I was supposed to go through. I'm like, I don't want to deal with that anymore. So I just didn't love coach. Don't do what you don't love. And you're not extremely confident to coach. Um, don't just throw it in like, Hey, like, you know, I, I used to laugh at sometimes my assistants would suggest in February, you know, I think zone would be good versus Michigan. They don't handle zone. Well, they didn't handle zone well last game. And I'd say, Hey guys, we haven't played a possession of zone all year. So why do you think, we're playing on a Saturday that we practice for 10 minutes because we're going to go light on a Friday. Why do you think zone would be effective? It's not going to be effective. Um, you know, so, so whatever it is that you're going to work on doing, I would say have a base and then a counter to that base because you will need to adjust um, whether it's kind of your A defense and your B. Um, but yes, look at what you've done and you hate going against. Um, and I, I'm doing a breakdown right now of, every team in the big 10 over the eight years that I've been in it and, and taking what I like without having too many things to do and, and, and running it and putting together that philosophy a little bit. But I know this guys hate going against insane ball pressure. Guys hate going against when that shot is up, they don't want to hit right. Obliterating the offensive glass the best that you can playing with a great level of physicality um, is really, really important. But um they don't, they don't like, they don't like seeing that people don't like getting hit. And uh, the teams in the big 10 I went against, they were always the most physical. So I want coaches to reflect on what you said, because you said so many great things there, but one of them especially is that you didn't love coaching it. And that's why you didn't use it. And I think that's paramount to our decisions as coaches. And I remember so many times going, Oh my gosh, this is so cool. I really like this concept. And then when I start coaching it, I go, yeah, this, this doesn't align with me. And this just isn't my thing. And that is so true in our decision-making as coaches. For sure. And that's why I think it's very, very important that your staff and you are on the same page. All the things that we ask of our players to communicate and, and, and talk to each other with respect and be on the same page. We got to be on the same page when we walk onto that basketball court, or court for practice every single day. But just because Bo Ryan and Greg Gard run the swing doesn't mean you have to run the swing. Uh, there's a million different ways to skin a cat, a million. And for every, you know, example that you have of pressing is good. I can give you an example of playing slow is good. And every coach, and there's the, the thing on Twitter where, you know, the guy makes fun of every coach who says we're going to play fast, um, which, what do you want us to say? We're going to play boring. At the end of the day, uh, I do believe this, do what you're comfortable with. Um, and if you don't want to fly the ball up and down the court and shoot a million threes, that's okay. Like I, I told my staff to do this, the most important thing is this. And I wrote the number 31 on the board. So we're going to play 31 games. The most important thing is whatever decisions that we make impact winning in those 31 games. That doesn't mean that winning is all that matters, but no, like let's make sure that we put this team in a position to succeed. So don't do it. If, you, if you're not good at coaching it, the players, the players are, I, I love our players and I love 
this age group that we coach, man, they're watching and they're dying for you to make mistakes. They're dying for you to show weakness and show show that you're not committed to playing a certain way. They see it. They know that you're not into it. So, you know, take the summer, take now that we have COVID times to, to build what it is that you want to do. And if you're going to play some zone, well, work on it every day. Even if you only play 20% of it, just work on it every day. Um, if you want to put a man on the ball and there ain't that about switch everything, but you all, you only want to do it every now and then still work on it every single day. You know, even if it's five minutes a day, uh, but the players know when you're not bought in and, uh, it's, and, and, and again, it's okay to be simple. Gonzaga, you watch Gonzaga play. I don't know what they do that's complicated. None of it's – they hardly run a set. They flow better than anybody, but it's really, really good. And uh, I think when you look at the legendary coaches, they're a lot less complicated than we think you are. So whatever it is that, it is that you're going to do – and again, like Purdue is the other way. Purdue is exhausting. The, what they do. I mean, it, it is exhausting, but it also works. Um, so, you know, it's um, have a belief, be very, very confident in your approach of what it is, get your guys to believe in it. Just like when you're selling and recruiting or you're selling to the fans, man, you, you're, you're 12, 13 guys have got to, got to know that coach believes in what it is you're doing. So if you don't like playing one, three, one, don't play one, three, one. If you don't like playing a three, two, don't play it. Find a couple different things that you want to do and get damn good at it. Great advice. And uh, building on what you just mentioned, some of the players and recruits and stuff. So I'm, I'm curious with the transition then, and now you have this new set of players and new group of recruits, maybe some the same. How are you handling the fired piece with them? Are you just acknowledging it and moving on? Do they even care? Does it even matter? Like, where does that fit into it? I don't think they care. Yeah. I, you know, I told them, I told them the other day, I said, guys, um, I hope I'm not talking about Minnesota much. I really do. I hope I'm not talking about FIU much. I hope I'm not talking about an assistant at Louisville, assistant in Florida, because it doesn't m- impact you. Uh, I think all they care about is, is where is New Mexico going, coach? Like, that, that's all they care about. Like, I know what winning looks like. You know what I mean? Like, it's not like I was a head coach for two, three years and it was a train wreck. Like, no, I, I know what it looks like. And you can certainly draw back on some good, you know, experiences that you had along the way. But talking about, you know, three years ago at Minnesota is not helping Jeremiah Francis on my team become a better point guard. Now, there's some illustrations that we could show on film. Of, hey, this is what I want it to look like. Great. Um, but they don't care. They, they want to know uh, what it is that, that can help them get better as a player. They want to know that I care about them as people. And they want to know, uh, you know, that, that, that what can we do to help them win? Now, I do tell these guys all the time in recruiting and in uh, coaching them, I had a chance to sit out and get paid and not work. I took this job because I believe in it. You know, I believe that it is a place with expectations to win championships. Uh, there's haves and have nots in conferences. New Mexico is a have in the Mountain West. Got a lot of work to do, but. Um, I could have sat back and my family loved Minnesota and I loved Minnesota. Uh, But I took this opportunity because I believe in it. So that's got nothing to do with Minnesota. It's got everything to do in the great belief uh, in what we're going to do here moving forward. Curious as well with the transition with the old coach, Paul, Weir, a good friend of mine, uh, Canadian and all that stuff. I'm wondering, is there any contact? Is there any connection back and forth generally when this type of thing happens? You know, I, I'll reach out to them. I, I, I think the biggest thing that I could do is like, like they won six games last year. They were put in the worst possible position I've ever seen. They were in like the hotel for like a hundred and something days. They didn't play a home game. So to sit here and say it's all Paul Weir's fault. Paul Weir worked for Marvin Menzies, uh, who's a good friend of mine and helped him build a powerhouse at New Mexico state. So, you know, it didn't work out to Paul. Um, you know, I want to give him a little bit of time, but he'll never hear me say that you, know, you got to change the culture because the culture was, you know, was bad. Like, I'm not one of those guys. Um, you know, I, I know that Paul is uh, did some terrific things. I think we were all dealt a lot of difficulties in COVID, him more so than anyone I've ever seen. Um, so it didn't work out for him here. It doesn't mean that he won't be great. I remember talking to Marvin about him in the past about potential assistant coaches. Uh, so, 
he'll he it'll never get back to him. I can promise this. And I think a lot of coaches make this mistake of they come in and they just trash the old regime. And it's just, it's, it's not a good look. Um, you know, like I, again, I, I know what happened at Minnesota. I think I built a program that was better than when I took over for it. That doesn't mean that Tubby Smith did, didn't do a great job, but we worked very, very hard to build a practice facility and, you know, back-to-back -back NBA players who knows of Marcus Carr is the most sought out, transfer in the country right now that's three in a row like Paul Weir did some really really good things um you know so I I'd welcome to getting together with him talking basketball I know he's he's done a lot of great things in this profession uh, but he'll never hear me trash him on the way out or that that's not my and I think coaches need to stop doing that because you'll be humbled quickly uh, all it takes is a couple of injuries or something might happen all of a sudden you're reminded um that hey it can get everybody um, you know, I mean, and that's just the, the nature of sports. Uh, so I would absolutely reach out to him uh, when we get time, get together with him. He, I know he's a great guy and loves basketball. Great guy, great coach, great and, person. And I think, yeah. I think a lot of these coaches too, I think maybe the younger guys, I, I, I bet you Paul, we're watching New Mexico to win. Just like I want Minnesota to win. Uh, we're not as bitter anymore, I think, as maybe some of the older generation. I always give my dad crap about that, but I'm not. Like, I remember when, I got fired at Minnesota. It was, you know, you got to get out of there. I'm like, why? Why do I have to get out of here? Like, my kid's got a great life. My wife's got a great life. I, I, I'm i still friends with a lot of people. Like, I'm okay. Uh, so hopefully Paul and, and anyone that goes through that understands it and doesn't take it personal. Well, good for you. I mean, I can't, can't thank you for sh sharing some of this stuff. I mean, just this honest look at the profession and kind of the things that we go through as coaches and especially at your level when we talk about some of those different things. Coach, I realize this might be a bit early to get into this too much, but there are also good things that have come out of this for you and your family and everything else. So can you talk a little bit about some of the positive experiences that have come out of this? Well, here's what I can say. Um, you know, I, I worked for some great people at Minnesota. Um, I worked for some great people at FIU. And now I'm going to work for a great guy, um, you know, some people in New Mexico. And that's the most important thing for any head coach when they take a job. Um Whenever you're deciding, and I do believe this, I always say, and this is not a knock on Minnesota because I loved Minnesota. I don't know if Minnesota is a top four job in the Big Ten, basketball-wise. I think the people of Minnesota would probably admit that. Um, I got a chance to go to a place where I know is a top four basketball job in the Mountain West. Is it as much money? No, it's not as much money. Is it in that power five? No, it's not. But every single day, I look at championship banners that happened as, as, as early as seven years ago, not 25 years ago. Um, so I am very, very lucky that I have taken over a place. They need basketball to be good. Um, there's revenue that's generated from it. I've come to a place where there's no professional sports. Again, I love the Twin Cities, but you're fighting in a major media market with a million different. New Mexico basketball is very important to this state. Uh, and you feel it every day. You feel it. So as much as I didn't want what went down in, at Minnesota to, to happen, more personally, I think that, you know, I loved it there personally, family-wise. I, I enjoyed working there. But, in, you know, it was – I think it was in alignment with what, what I was all about. But I was ready for – to be rejuvenated and get a different look at something. Um, so I'm fired up about that. Um, I'm fired up quite frankly, to be at a place where you're not reminded constantly about a recruit you missed out on or this or that, like that's good for coaches. You know, I mean, I, I think it's good. Eight, eight years in our profession is a long, long time. And, and you are judged. I talked to Tim Miles about this before all this, that you're always judged when you're at a place by your best year. And, and they're going to constantly go, you know, it was just three years ago. I was in the NCAA tournament. We beat Louisville. That was like their second, win in the NCAA tournament, like 25 years. Um, but you're constantly reminded about your best year. So you get to wipe the slate clean. You get to be in a place that is obsessed with basketball. Um, and it's evident. They want to win. They need to win. You know, it, it's going to help everybody if they win. So very, very lucky to do that. Um, so grateful and happy that I did it. As much as I'm going to miss the great friends that I met in Minnesota um, and love living there. This is an awesome adventure to go live in the Southwest. I never thought I'd live in the Southwest. 
I'm going to be recruiting areas I've never really recruited before in Southern California and Arizona and Texas and Colorado and Vegas. And that's the fun of it. Get into this profession because you want to have fun and enjoy it. So very, very grateful for it. Um, landed, like I said, and I believe a, a top three, top four job in the league. And you get it, you give yourself a chance to win every single year. Well, I'm very excited for you and so, so refreshing to hear you talk in this way about the profession and, uh, you know, your love for places that you've been and your love for places that you are now. And uh, that's the way we should all approach things. So thank you, Coach, for, so, for sharing all this with us. No, absolutely. Like I said, it's, it's all the way we look at it. I think we have too many coaches in our profession who constantly complain about what's difficult about this profession. And I always say to them, well, go do something else. But if you're going to do this, have a positive attitude every single day. This is what we signed up for. I love New Mexico. Probably not the last place I'm going to work, right? I mean, it's just the reality of it. Embrace it. Love coaching basketball. Love being part of a team, right? I mean, all the doesn't matter where we live. We can live anywhere. And for your families, like, we're torn up. I mean, my wife calls me every night crying. And I said, listen, honey, like, if we love each other, and we're great. We're going to be fine wherever we go. We'll meet great people everywhere. Um, you know, just embrace it. Love it. It's, it's a fun ride. It's better than a real job. Um, and enjoy every second of it because you just never know what the future holds. And, you know, don't complain. I think that there's one thing in eight years at Minnesota that any media member or any, and I never complain. I never made excuses. Uh, make the best of what the opportunities you have and keep pushing to get better every day. Great stuff, Coach. Thanks for sharing the game. All right. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it.